So um, much like Phasecraft, I work for River Lane, and we are also um, a software company for quantum computers. Um, so in my slightly biased opinion, I think quantum computing is a very exciting field to be in at the moment. So this figure here is showing the development of hardware over time um, for two different technologies. So there are several different technologies used to build quantum computers. Different companies work on different ones. And I think you might hear from a couple uh, later in the day. But here we've just picked two technologies, trapped iron and superconducting quantum computers. Um, and you, what you can see is that over time, their performance is increasing exponentially over the last couple of decades. Um, so by some measure, we've called quantum power, um, which is measuring the number of operations you can perform. And we made this figure a couple of years ago, but what you can see is, looking at the way the resources were going, we were predicting something called computational supremacy in 2019. And as you may have heard, um, as was mentioned in the last talk, Google actually achieved this milestone last year. And what this means is this is the first time a calculation has been performed on a quantum computer that couldn't be performed on a classical computer. And whilst this calculation itself doesn't really have a real world application, it's a really exciting milestone showing the way the field's going on the way to being able to do um, calculations of things that can be applied. So the other side of quantum computing coin is then software, and at the same time as the power that the devices have has increased, the requirements of the software have decreased. And this is what uh, part of what River Lane is continuing to work on, is improving um, the current algorithms to bring closer to the present day, the time when we'll be able to do calculations um, that can't be done on a classical computer and have real-world applications. And the main focus of River Lane's work is on computational chemistry type calculations. So, um, for example, simulating molecular systems. Uh, this is a super simple example of a, a toy uh, picture of a hydrogen molecule. And the types of calculations we're interested in are the energies of molecules um, at different geometries. So here you can see the ground, ground state energy is the lowest line and then the energy of excited states at different geometries of the hydrogen molecule. This is such a small system that it's really easy to calculate exactly on a classical computer. But as your system gets bigger and bigger, the, resources, the classical resources required grow exponentially until um, you're not able to perform exact calculations anymore. However, because quantum computers kind of naturally capture the quantum effects present um, in molecules, they have um, an advantage and so can be used on these larger systems. So kind of illustratively, um, this sort of purple triangle is showing um, classical computational methods and there's a strong trade-off between the speed and the kind of predictive power of the calculations that um, can be performed. So once the systems get very big, it's just impossible to perform exact calculations because it takes too long. But quantum computers, once they're big enough, have the potential to combine both the speed and predictive power. And um, so thinking about applications, like in the last talk, for molecular systems, this could be things like um, you can model biological systems and look at how drugs interact with them. You can look at the energy along reaction pathways to try and find catalysts, um, materials calculations. So the River Lane team, we are a team of 15 people based in the centre of Cambridge. And although the end applications are very chemistry focused and we do have people from chemistry backgrounds, we also have people from a wide variety of other backgrounds. Um, because there are so many different levels of the sort of algorithm development that people from different backgrounds work well in different areas. So we have computer scientists, mathematicians, physicists, um, all kind of working together and bringing knowledge to different areas of um, what we do. And so just a quick taste of one of the things um, we've worked on over the last year. Um, it was mentioned in the last talk that one of the algorithms used for computational chemistry calculations is known as the variational quantum eigensolver. 
And one of the characteristics of this is you have to run lots of circuits on the quantum computer. So circuits are the operations that are performed on the quantum computer, and then typically at the end you make a measurement and it tells you something. And in the variational quantum eigensolver, you have to run lots and lots of these circuits and make lots and lots of measurements. And so it takes a very long time. And one of the methods we worked on was reducing the number of these circuits. Um, you have to perform by getting more information out of a single run of the circuit. So that's kind of what the schematic on the left is meant to be showing, going from lots of circuits to just one circuit. And then this is uh, the graph on the right is showing the sort of advantage you gain by doing this. So you can see as the system size gets bigger, on the bottom we've got the number of qubits, which um, tells you about the size of the chemical system you're considering, um, the speed up increases. Um, so moving on to how I ended up where I am today. Um, I did an undergraduate degree in physics, um, and as I was entering sort of the fourth year of my PhD, I really had no idea what I wanted to do next. I thought I maybe liked the idea of doing a PhD, but I didn't really know what in. Um, and it was just the sort of chance of one of the options I did in fourth year was actually a geophysics um, option. I ended up doing a project in geophysics and then, um, yeah, started a PhD in uh, geophysics, working on um, a process known as glacial isostatic adjustment. Uh, which is kind of shown in this figure here. So, uh, very briefly, this is the how the solid Earth deforms over ice age timescales as ice melts and forms on the surface. So you can see in the first picture, um, there's a glacier on the left-hand side, and then by the second picture, it's melted. So there's obviously more water in the ocean, so far away from the ice sheet, sea level has risen, but because a big weight's been lifted off the Earth, the earth actually moves upwards and sea level falls locally to the glacier. And there are also effects like the glacier exerted a gravitational pull on the seawater, which has then moved away um, by the time the ice has melted. So I looked at this process um, and using measurements of how sea level changed to learn about where and when ice is melting and also about the structure um, of the earth. So. Um, I really enjoyed my PhD, but I realised the thing I most enjoyed was the sort of day-to-day -day of doing computational physics um, and working on analytical problems, and I thought I probably didn't want to stay in academia. And so towards the end of my PhD, I was looking at what other things I might consider doing and decided to do an internship. Um, so I ended up doing a civil service internship. Um, so operational research is kind of one of the analytical um, aspects of the civil service. Um, during the summer at the end of my third year of my PhD. And that was really valuable for me just to give more, um, kind of more information about the things I liked in a job. So I really liked the kind of more short term driven uh, goals. Um, and using kind of analytical and computational skills in a slightly different context to my PhD. But I realised um, the civil service is obviously a very huge institution, and so you feel like quite a small, uh, a small wheel in a very big um, kind of machine. So when I came back to do my PhD, to finish off my PhD, and was thinking about applying for jobs, I was looking for kind of things that combine these analytic um, skills, but in a maybe smaller situation. Um, it hadn't occurred to me that there might be jobs where I could do kind of computational physics um, and so I was mostly applying for sort of data science, other analytical things and then when I saw so a job at the River Lane which seemed to combine computational and analytical physics, um, I thought that sounded really interesting so I applied for the job and kind of ended up there slightly by accident um, but I'm very happy I did. So this was obviously um, quite a big change for me. This is meant to illustrate my 15 orders of magnitude move to the left. Um, so yeah, I did find it for a couple of months, it, or at least a couple of months. I obviously didn't know very much about kind of the quantum field at all, and so it took me time to kind of get to grips with it. 
but there were also lots of transferable things um, that meant I had the right skills, it was just a case of um, learning how to apply them in that particular context. Um, and so given that path, I just wanted to end with a few kind of thoughts about the way I got there and things that might have been helpful if um, someone had said them to me. So I know deciding whether or not to do a PhD is quite a difficult thing to do. Um, it obviously does need to be something that you're interested in enough to do for four years or the potential for longer if you'd like a career in academia. But I think also, as obviously my path um, has shown, it doesn't need to be the be all and end all. Um, and you can just do a PhD that gives you skills um, and kind of a good experience that you can then apply elsewhere. Um, and yeah, so following on from that, after a PhD, there are, a PhD in itself does give you um, transferable skills that you can take elsewhere, um, whilst also providing the opportunity to go into academia, um, if that's what you feel like doing. And the other thing is deciding what job to do, I know is very difficult, and I certainly, by the end of undergraduate, I wouldn't have had much of an idea at all. Um, for me, in that regard, doing an internship was very helpful, not necessarily because um, it meant, oh, I definitely want to do that, but just it gives you a feel for kind of what's out there um, and lets you understand yourself, kind of what you want in a job or, um, or not. Um, and so finally, if you are interested in looking at um, Algorithm development in quantum computing, we have an undergraduate internship scheme. Um, the deadline's a couple of weeks away, um, but yeah, please either talk to me more or just visit our website um, if you'd like to learn more. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions for uh, Ophelia? Okay, well I have a question. Um, looking back on sort of your path towards where you are now, working in Riverdale, um, do you personally think that you, are you glad that you did a PhD or do, you, or do you think that you should have maybe just looked at sort of a way out at the master's level and gone into the job market that way? That, yeah, that's, that's a really good point and one of the things I slightly worried about coming to the end of my PhD was, oh, am I just going to end up in a job? that I could have done four years earlier. Um, but in the end, I actually felt the, the experience itself I did really enjoy, even though I wasn't using it later. And it also did make me more qualified for kind of many jobs that were out there. Um, so yeah, my opinion on it is obviously just my path, my particular experience is that a PhD in itself, even if you don't directly use it, it does, provide you with good experience for other things you do. So, you know, I'm definitely glad I did my PhD. Thank you. Uh, oh, we've got a question in the middle right here. Hi, I'm currently sort of choosing between doing PhD or like taking more of a onto the quantum community, but generally when you tend to find like the job specs or whatever, they seem to say software development is something that they're really looking for. So if I was to I don't know, sort of delay the idea of uh, a while and go through an industry route. I don't know if this is going to help, no. Um, uh, would the people in Riverlane, has anyone entered the quantum community by just going through a software developer route? Or, like, what would be the stepping stone, I guess, through industry? Um, yeah, so our, our kind of full time jobs say, PhD or equivalent experience. So I think what a PhD provides is that environment of kind of coming up with your own ideas and um, yeah, kind of learning how to explore your own projects. So um, yeah, absolutely coming through an industry route is something, yeah, we're very, um, yeah, we're perfectly keen on and there's no reason that's not as good as a PhD. Um, provided there's kind of some amount of exploring your own ideas, I think that's kind of where what we're looking for. Um, does that does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, I suppose I was sort of more asking for what 
like specific jobs do you think there are in the market that are I suppose this would require quite a large sort of overview of what's actually out there, but which would provide me the skills that would be kind of similar to it. Like obviously a PhD is very mm. very unique in that way. But if I was to go through an industry, what would be the kind of job that I'd be looking for? Would it generally just be a software developer? Like Yeah, or I guess I guess maybe like a slightly <coughs> research led type company. Although I imagine things like I I don't know, this is slight conjecture, but say within a data science company you presumably have sort of big projects that there's a team of people working on and there is opportunity to kind of yeah, explore sure that works, project. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so yeah, I can't claim to know the jobs market that well, but yeah, rather than, yeah, I, I think kind of anything analytical that allows you to work on a project and grow, as you say. Um, Thank that you. is super vague, but... <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got time for one more question. Actually, it's a, it's a bit of a comment um, following on from that. So I'm with BA Systems, and we've just hired someone who did his PhD in quantum five years ago. Different market then, and he wanted to be working in industry. And what he did for five years was he joined consulting companies, mm -hmm. and in five years, there was a business consulting work. So he's now got this apprenticeship in business consulting, knows how to talk to clients, but um, got itchy feet and wanted to get back into quantum. So he's joined my team and he can now help engage with big end users. So he's not going to be engaging with quantum technology companies. He's going to be engaging with other people, help them understand where there are the possibilities. And he's got absolutely the right kind of background. So you know, there are opportunities if you I did your master's or PhD, went into industry, you got the opportunity coming back into more higher tech but learning other very useful transferable skills. So it's not a question, but a bit of a comment. Yeah, I, th I think that's absolutely true. Um, and I guess that there are so many different things you can have experience of. And so yeah, having experience of engaging with kind of the end users and the more broader thing is obviously a very valuable experience. Um, yeah. Great, okay, well let's thank Dr. Virginia. Yeah.